the games have started to get a little bit more competitive. Um, and and so our, our opening choices have, have brought into slightly more clear re reality, or relief rather, the sort of difference between playing solidly, playing aggressively. Uh, let's continue, here we go. And 10 minute chess is what we play. Uh, and we get, okay, so we got white against Adelaide Klassen. Let's go e4. Let's get the pen out. Okay, and we have been playing the Danish, no need to deviate, we have been getting winning positions out of the opening every game. Um, and this continues to stump most people below 1300, but now we see another e takes d4, so c3. Um, dc and bishop c4 enters the Danish. Um, black doesn't have to take on c3. Uh, and we've encountered, yeah, so he does take on c3, and here we see players finally beginning to enter the main lines. Right around 1200, uh, you know, standard rating on chess.com, I would say is the very rough threshold when we start seeing more of the main lines than the sidelines. Um, and Hansky, oh, I'm happy to do it. Okay, so Queen E7. But as I say that, um, our opponent plays a very strange move. So I think that obviously black is targeting the pawn, but this is not a good way to do it because no other pieces are developed. So what should white do here? I mean, no need to reinvent the wheel. We have an obvious move. Yeah, just knight takes c3, of course. And now we've got two pieces developed. This queen on e7, I've actually noticed this as a pattern. A lot of players at this level really like to put the queen on e7. And that, that is one of the most pernicious developing moves you could make because you are obstructing the development of the bishop and that's a big problem. And that queen is also incredibly vulnerable. The one thing that justifies it potentially is the fact that it x-rays the pawn, right? Thank you, DP Dick. And if we were to just go knight f3 here nonchalantly, which is the obvious developing move, then d5 happens, right? That's the entire concept. Is this actually dangerous? No, because we are we have such a big lead in development that we actually want black to play d5. We want black to open up the center for us. I hope that our opponent will play d5 so I can show you, okay, so he doesn't, he continues to push his pawns. This is gonna be a complete disaster. Um, you, you can't abandon your development like this. Um, and this will backfire in about three three to four moves. So what should we do? We should just castle. And we've been through this a million times, right? There, there's no need to go crazy with any kind of sacrifices. Simply by completing your development, you are already doing yourself a huge favor. Now this is where we need to demonstrate a little bit of creativity. Um, D6 is not a bad move. This is, is, is a lesser, lesser evil. We have two approaches here. We have what I would define as the sort of straightforward brute force approach, where we just try to sacrifice and blast open the center. And that would involve doing what? That would involve playing e5. And in the event of d5, just sacrificing on d5. I feel like that's a little bit unclear. I'm not convinced by that. So I have another idea. Now you guys should all notice, as do I, that there's a queen and a king on the same file. I've told you to, to pay attention to that very carefully when it occurs. And that may seem like a moot point because there is a pawn on e4. If there was no pawn on e4, we would play rook e1, but we can try to, yeah, exactly. We can play rook e1. And as those of you with a keen tactical eye will notice, knight d5 is, uh, thank you, de uh, devil of all, knight d5 is what we're setting up here, okay? Among other things, among other things like e5. Like if he goes knight f6, which is quite likely actually, because he might be like, okay, let's finally develop our pieces. He walks, ironically, uh, the moment he starts developing uh, is precisely the decisive mistake. Although, really, the decisive mistake has already been committed. I don't think there's any getting, there's any way to get out of this. Yeah, rookie, rookie one is very patient. It's very, very strong. It sets up knight d5. C, D, E, D just spins the queen. And it makes e5 a whole lot stronger. All right, bishop e6. Okay, good move. Good move. What should we do in response? You guys already know. Well, why did we play rookie one? We played it in order to set up. Bishop b3, you guys are playing, you know, like a very old, you know, chess professor, Bishop b3, but this isn't the London system. 
Um, remember why we played rookie one? We played rookie one in order to sacrifice a knight on d5, which isn't even a sacrifice. Because if you play c takes d5, then there's e takes d5. Now, if we played e5 here, that would mix up two plans. It would allow d5, and we wouldn't have any clear way forward, right? And I'll show that after the game. Knight d5, I think, is the principal move here. Well, let me just write this down. e5 is, a, is, is, is interesting, and he immediately takes which is disastrous because after e takes d5, this bishop is going to be lost. And once we take that bishop, the entire position just totally collapses, collapses in on itself. I mean, I hope this makes sense. I hope that the concept behind knight d5 makes sense. We're just trying to open up the, the e file. And just because he's put a bishop there doesn't mean uh, that, that this entire operation is not worth pursuing. It's very much worth pursuing. He, he just doesn't have any pieces out. <laughs> That's as simple as that. There's no other way to define it. Um, and we might be down a pawn. I'm not even counting the pawns. I don't care. doesn't matter. Um, this is game over. You, you can't get away with something. You, you just can't do that. And the entire time, the queen on e7, this placement of the queen just kills him. Because he can't get the bishop out. He gets skewered by the rook. And yeah, and, and he can't avoid just losing his queen. He takes f7 check. Um... Now, this idea of knight d5, okay, so knight e4, I mean, just take it. Ah, he wants this, okay. So I see, I see what he wants, actually. <laughs> that doesn't really help. Although it's a creative defensive approach. I, I should have probably taken an f7 first. No, not that it matters. Um, not that it matters. Okay. I can pass it. F6. So if you really want the... The bamboo stick kind of move here, right? The first thing I, I see just, and my brain is trained to look for this, are these dark squares, right? The dark squares are so juicy. How do we exploit them? What do we exploit them with, first of all? Um, 100 bits, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, knights are, you know, the premier piece to exploit weak squares with. Uh, knights are the screwdriver of chess. You can just chisel your way into, um, you know, these these small spaces, and um, in combination with the queen, the knight is an absolutely lethal tandem. The light squares are really really good. Oh, did I say dark squares? Yeah, I meant the light squares. That is a sexy move indeed. And you'll see this often in more double-sided positions. You know, <laughs> this idea of getting the knight to one of these squares. It doesn't even matter where we go. Um, we can go for his rook, but we don't even have to. We can go directly for head on, apply directly to the forehead. We'll we'll go for his rook here just because I don't know. I think it'll make him resign faster. But this kind of stuff, it really doesn't matter. You don't you don't need to, you know, drive yourself crazy trying to find you know, the computer continuation. Just take his rook. We're up a rook and a piece, and it's time for him to resign. All right, check. Yeah. Now, he's got to go to d8. We can give him a check on f7, although that would be quite uh, kind of counterproductive because that would allow him to tuck his king on c8. The best would be to get the queen into f7. That way we would be threatening immediate checkmate, right? Yeah, and we'll, I'll, I'll, as I always do, I'll answer the questions after the game. Let's finish our development here. Bishop f4, he correctly goes king c8. The funny thing is the game drags on a little while longer. Um, this is, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what he's hoping for here. Yeah. No, I mean, there's no mate. But, you know, like, how do we actually win this position? Some of you may choose to take his pawns here and just promote. That's possible. Knight g6 is possible. I always like a move like rook c1, just bringing all the pieces in. And that's a good good rule to live by. Just the more pieces you bring in to the attack, no matter how many extra pieces you have, the better off you're going to be in the end. So, okay, g5, just drop the bishop back. And I know it looks like, why are we not mating him faster? Um, as my first coach would always say, 
do they record on the uh, results score sheet how many moves the game took? And you know, it was a rhetorical question, obviously, and I was supposed to say no. And the sentiment was supposed to be that you know you're supposed to be patient in how you convert these positions. Okay. Of course, I understand that, but even but even for a 1200, I think this is a resignable position. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, this is just rook c6 is coming in. This is a pin. Not much to talk about in this position. Okay. I mean, the funny thing... Okay, so let's find the fastest mate. No, let's not. <laughs> let's just take all of his pieces. Thank you, R O R two thousand eight eighteen. I'm just going to look next chat. Yeah. Queen b6, queen b7, and b4. Forest, mate. Yeah, I mean, okay, come on. Queen B7. Get over here. All right. Finally, we deliver checkmate. Um, play this out to see if I was reportable. Yes. Oh, my lands, we are reported. So this is a very big mistake. And I think the impulse is, is understandable. Queen e7 isn't always bad. And Ryan, I'll, I'll, I'll play you next. Um, I'll play you next. And, and, we'll, and, and that'll be my final game. But, uh, you know, the, the damage that this move does is, is tremendous, particularly given that you're already behind in development. Now, a little bit later, I will talk about the proper way of playing here, but not right now. So knight c3, c6, that is actually not a bad move. And, okay, so let's talk for a second about d5. Right, we can't take on d5. We drop the bishop back, d takes c4. A lot of people would reject this because black wins a second pawn. But you have to see the bigger picture here. Black is opening up the center, which is a great thing for white. It's, black is also helping you open up this bishop. So what would be white's, like, simplest move here? And literally... You just play according to the formula. You know what to do when there's a bishop on b3. You can castle and give up the knight, but even simpler than that, no need to even calculate that. No need to calculate that. Now, you guys are falling for this. Remember that bishop e6 is always something to reckon with in these positions. Knight g5 is what I'm thinking of. Threatening knight f7, no good way to defend it. Then we castle, but then we pick up the pawn and go rook e1. Um, it's going to be a massacre down the e-file. All right, um, so this is crushing. Uh, so h6 castles d6, and yeah, um, e5, d5 would be the other approach, but I actually couldn't make this work entirely. We could sacrifice like this, but a position like this is uh, actually quite a bit more double-sided than it may seem. So it's that's far from clear. That's why we chose rook e1. What if black pushes e3? Where? Oh, you mean here? Well, e3 doesn't do anything. I mean, e3, you can just win the queen like this. Or you could even just take on e3. That doesn't actually do anything. All right. So he goes... Wait, sorry. He goes h6. Um, too many pawn moves, obviously. d6, rook e1. And now the key move, knight c5. And the decisive mistake, cd loses immediately. The interesting bit would have happened after queen to d8. And... Um, the funny thing is, this knight on d5, right, um, it, it's it's a good knight, but a, it, in and of itself, it doesn't win, win you the game. You have to have a supporting cast here. How do you build up the supporting cast? What should white do in this position? And the first thing you should realize is that black doesn't threaten c takes d5. You still have e takes d5. So you don't need to worry about that knight being hanging. It's not. What should you do? There's a very sexy, well, there's a very nice move here. Who can find it? Not, a, not the easiest move to spot. So this is fine, right? Bishop f4 is a B plus move. Bishop f4 is a B plus move. But I think you guys would agree with me. Black plays knight d7. Black can slowly start to untangle. The A move is knight d4. Yeah. 
Okay, now there's a very concrete idea. And the very concrete idea is revealed. If black plays knight d7, tragedy is going to strike boom. The moment the f7 pawn departs from this square, this diagonal weakens. The knight covers e7. This is checkmate, right? Um, so that's the threat. This threat is very hard to defend against. And if you move the bishop away, now the e-file is wide open. And only now is the time to go e5. Look at how overwhelming this position is. I'm not calculating a single variation. And yet I can tell you without an inkling of doubt that this is probably like plus 20 or, or probably maybe even like, you know, forced to make. Maybe e5 is, a, is not the most patient, but I, I can guarantee you that this is completely winning. Okay. So this is just absolutely crushing. Tyrox, thank you for the prime. And moves like knight d4 are, you know, they're very easy to miss. They're very, very easy to miss. And the way that you, the way that you find them oftentimes is, is to realize that in these, when, when you're ahead in development, when you have a big development advantage, um, you can sometimes afford to move the same piece more than once. So if there's something specific that you want to get done, such as eliminating this bishop from e6, that is a, that is a bigger priority than completing your development sometimes. All right, so he takes on d5 and the game ends immediately. I mean, after ed, and we don't have to look at the rest. Boom, take it, and then knight h4, and, 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 and it's just totally and absolutely crushing. Um, 100 bits from Magon, thank you, and Tyrox for the prime. Any questions? I'll play uh, Ryan next. Okay. All right. No, it's not immediately obvious. And we got a white game against Ryan. And uh, let's go e4. Okay. So we are facing a Karakhan. Now, um, this is an interesting dilemma because I, I professed to play very aggressively and the most aggressive line against the Karakhan, without a doubt, is the fantasy variation. That is what we're going to play. Now, I, I don't love this from the perspective of teaching beginners um, because the fantasy variation involves making a certain move that people have a certain relationship with, and that move is, of course, f3. Yeah. Okay, so d takes c4, f takes c4. The point of the fantasy is to preserve the center and also to open up the f-file as we did here. Ryan is already playing it way too passively. He's gone e6, he's blocked the development of his bishop, he's allowed us full control over the center, and now the development is going to be very, very natural. Now we can go knight f3. Now where should this bishop go? All right. So some of you saying c4, don't bite on granite. Yep, bishop d3 is much better. Now we just castle. So we're making simple developing moves. And black's position is still quite solid. We shouldn't go crazy here, but we've got a, a, just a, a phenomenal position. All right, now here, again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can play knight c3, just continue developing our pieces. Um. But we don't we don't have to. That's not the only way that we can play it. Yeah, so this move e5, some of you are thinking of. I wouldn't rush that move. And what is the rush in playing e5? What could end up happening is you allow him to play c5 and undermine the center. So let's let's go with knight c3. Let's let's first develop our pieces. He's not gonna go e5, and the blunder's a pawn. Okay, now that he's castled, now uh, it is high time for us to open up this bishop. And, and play e5. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, what do you mean open up this bishop? Now it's like staring at the knight. Well, yes, but um, this knight could later be dislodged. And uh, it can be dislodged a lot faster than perhaps some of you may realize. And hopefully I'll get a chance to demonstrate this. There is a very typical plan in such positions uh, that that is precisely aimed at dislodging such a knight. And I can show you many real life examples of this. And well, we will get a chance to demonstrate it. Now, this is kind of complicated and some of the logic behind this I'll explain after the game. The skeleton though you guys should all be able to see. 
Um, when I say dislodge a piece, you should immediately be thinking of pawns. Pawns are like the mercenaries that allow you to reliably get a piece off of a square because every minor piece, every heavy piece, they all have to, res they all must re honor um, being attacked by a pawn. And so the move here is h4. That's not the only move. And Ryan immediately responds with queen b6. That's actually a super tricky move. That is a super tricky move. So in, in answer to h5, we notice that he is skewering the pawn, which means that knight g takes e5 becomes possible. So we need to play in a much more measured way here. What should we do here? Well, we can move our king away. That would be fine in order to get rid of the, the, the pin. Um, in fact, that might even be the best move. But if we want to do something kind of five head, wait, let me think about this for a second. Yeah, so there's some really cool lines here. After queen e2, he's got a he's got a cool tactic. Um, let me write down why. So queen e2 is not the best move, and I'll show you guys after. The, yeah, so I initially thought of this, but after the game, I'll show you why we're not going to go for this. And um, let's indeed stick to stick to our guns, stick to our initial guns, and let's move the king away. King h2, king h1 doesn't matter which one. Getting rid of okay, knight I take h2. So now we take, and this is an undefended bishop. We have accomplished our goal. The bishop now has a direct line of communication with this pawn. And some of you may fall in love with the concept of taking on h7 and then playing queen h5, but always try to get the order right. Why do that when you can directly play queen h5 and fork the pawn and the bishop? The game is essentially over. So this uh, idea of h4, may seem particularly uh, crazy to some because, well, because we're, we're moving pawns, we're in H pawn on the same side as your king. Like what kind of lunatic would do that? And yet it's perfectly justified, trust me. Now here, this is a great example of not rushing and um, always looking for the best move. So we could take the bishop and we're completely winning, but in the name of playing Daniel style, playing insane chess, what if we just, looked at this for a second and said, wait a second, do we even need to take this bishop? What if we get directly down to business, down to the business of checkmating him? Bishop h6 is just a no-brainer attack. I mean, look at all these pieces accumulated on the king side. We don't even need this bishop. Now, this is something you shouldn't do um, unless you're absolutely confident that uh, this is going to work because taking the bishop would be the safe option. We're up a piece. And then we could play bishop h6 at our convenience. I'm just trying to show you guys the process, right? The process of not playing moves automatically, that's important. This specific instance where we play bishop h6, not as important. Yeah, he is dead. Queen d8, okay. Now we have a very pretty move. I mean, we have several pretty ways to win the game. Who can see it? So, what's the, log what's the logical process here? Yeah, bishop g7 or bishop g5. Um, the logical process is to realize that queen h7 is going to be checkmate. We need, we need to move the bishop. And as I always say, we need to do as much damage as possible with that bishop. And we can do a lot of damage by winning the queen, <laughs> bishop g5, or just like winning everything else with bishop. This is the fastest just mate. Maybe he can stave off the mate with a couple of moves here. Um, let's see if he finds them. But not for very long. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find for you guys some real life examples of this H4 concept. Oh, I know exactly what to show you. I'll show you guys a couple of things here. You're in for a little finale, finale um, treat. Good game, Ryan. That was awesome. Um, that was awesome and a very instructive one, I think. So fantasy variation um, was first played in the year 1890 by Max Harmonist. That was his last name, Harmonist. He, his pieces were always well placed, they were always in harmony. Against uh, the one and only Kurt von Bartleben. And Kurt von Bartleben is known for playing a very famous game, of course, against Wilhelm Steinitz, right? The rookie seven, rook f7, rook g7 game. Um, and Bartleben seemed to be on the losing end of a lot of these games. He lost this game as well. And you know, the, 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 and a lot of um, 
Marozzi played F3, Tartakauer, Alakine played F3 a bunch. These were very forward thinking people because to play F3 and to realize that it's okay to weaken your king like this is, you know, quite forward thinking. And it still is one of the most reputable lines against the Karo. It's experienced a resurgence in recent years. It's called the fantasy variation. Now, I have previously gone on record and said that if you're a beginner and you're looking for a good line against the Karo Khan, uh, the exchange with bishop d3, not only is this a good line objectively, sorry, not only is this a good line practically, it's objectively considered right now, I think, to be one of White's best tries for a slight advantage. Thank you, Andy Miller. Um, now, what is the point of f3? Well, obviously to preserve the center. That's, that's it. Like, that's all there is to it. You're trying to preserve the center. And, you know, Ryan, I, I sympathize because it's very hard to figure out what to do here. If you've not seen this before, you haven't studied it. Black has a million different setups here, all of which are okay. The uh, old school line is to play D takes E4 and then E5. And of course, if white just myopically takes on E5, then you fall into the Damiano trap. That's not what white's supposed to do here. White goes V on a gambit style, knight F3, bishop C4, sort of quickly developing. It's the same spirit of gambit play. And then you get super sharp positions here that are a little bit beyond the scope of what we're discussing right now. Um, but I think that in this position after knight f3, one of the best moves, according to modern theory, is to play the move bishop e6. This is actually not that common, but if you want a little bit of an inside scoop, this is a good move. It looks a little bit weird, right? Like, wait a second, knight takes e5. But again, remember, there's queen h4 check. And d takes e5 is just never dangerous because it ruins white's pawn structure. It gives the bishop a beautiful square on c5. You don't even have to worry about winning this pawn out immediately. Um, there's also moves like queen b6, which are quite dangerous. Yes, that is also possible. Um, and black can play g6 here as well. Black can play even e6 here. But the combination of taking an e6, Ryan, that is a little bit passive because you're giving me the entire center of the f file and you're closing down the bishop, which is understandable. Um, so, yeah, but e6, your move, has been played in 70 games. So even some pretty decent players have played it. So knight f3, um, you know, this this has happened before many, many times. And knight e7 was played twice, um, interestingly enough. Now, that's an understandable maneuver. I don't think this is bad, actually. All right. Yeah, I've played the tall variation in the advance. Now, any questions thus far? Any questions thus far? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So bishop d3, knight g6, castles bishop e7. Um, knight c3 developing. Now one thing to consider in such positions, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the possibility of c3. This gave me some pause. Um, and sometimes you want to do this, where instead of putting the knight on c3, you create a little bit of a pawn chain just so your center is a little more solid. And the way that you could go around this is you could play bishop e3 and then knight b to d2. We've seen this before. So I'm just trying to expose you guys to the various ways in which you can complete your development. You don't always have to put your head down and go nice and three knight f3, bishop d3, bishop b3. The knight on c3 um, is, is, that is usually the best placement for the knight, but the knight is often also good on d2. Now, the most interesting moment in the game, okay, here the move e5 is, pretty darn obvious, I would say, right? We're opening up the bishop, but that is only good provided that we can get the knight out of g6. Now, if I were you, Ryan, I think c5 was probably your best chance here. I think c5 was probably your best chance, okay? Uh, because in light of what happened after this, you have to try to create chances in the center. And I would have just taken on c5, and after bishop c5, king h1, black is in trouble here without a doubt. But at least you get a little bit more activity for your pieces. I mean, you should see this, right? Um, not like you should see c5, but in this position, you should see that at least black can play. And knight d7, understandable, you're developing your piece. I mean, every move you played was perfectly logical. So I sprung the fantasy on you. That's a hard line to figure out what to do in. I, I mean, so I appreciate you being game for this. And now the move h4, right? So... Um, here is a game that I played in 2014, a rapid game, in a position that may seem entirely unrelated, 
entirely unrelated. Um, give me a second, it's a chess base scene. I'll show you guys two illustrative examples here from different, different sources, I would say. Julio Sedora, Grandmaster. Um, I'm playing black, and this is a Nimzo Indian, you know, sort of a position, position, whatever. In a position. You get this position, right? And black's position is a little bit past, although it's a semi semi slop structure. And in this position, what do you guys think that being the psychopath that I am, being the complete psychopath that I am, um, this is a classic Daniel move. What did what do you think I did? Right. <laughs> yeah, try. So there's two things to understand here. The first is the conceptual underpinning. Like what, why can you get away? And this is a frustration, I think a lot of, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I think that this is a frustration felt by some beginners and intermediate players as you guys watch top GMs. Like why can they get away with violations of these rules? Um, and the bottom line is that this rule about not pushing pawns in front of your king should be taken with a serious grain of salt. The king is very safe on g8. Just because you're pushing pawns in front of that king doesn't automatically grant white some sort of mythical attacking powers. White is nowhere near um, getting into attack against my king. And I still have this, this exoskeleton fully intact. So don't um, overgeneralize this and uh, consider moves like these concretely rather than... Um, as part of some sort of general rule, like, oh, you go h5, so your king is now incredibly weak. The second thing to understand, the idea here is very simple. You wanna dislodge the knight from g3, kick it away, and it has no good place to go. And if it goes back, then this bishop opens up, creating attacking chances for black. And if knight takes h5, then just as in the game, knight takes h5, bishop takes h5, identical concept, we've succeeded. And now we go queen h4, uh, forking, uh, the bishop and the pawn. So my opponent went f4, which is a which is a really interesting move. He's also pushing a pawn from our, in front of his king, and he's trying to blunt the bishop in preparation for h4, which I played anyway. And then I struck with c5. I got a really nice position here. That knight took a while getting back in the game. And uh, so I took this opportunity to sort of open up the position. Um, so you will find that this idea of kicking away the knight on g3 or g6 by pushing the h pawn is actually a, is actually very, very common. And I just remembered another game that I played a couple of years ago um, when I was just becoming a GM. Let me see if I can track it down. Yes, I can. And in this game, in this game, yeah, Campos Moreno. So I was, I was, um, I was an IM and it was another Nimzo. That was the stage when I played the Nimzo Indian together with the Kings Indian. And, um, here is another uh, good example of that, right? So, first of all, we reach this position. And I was thinking, okay, this is an IQP. Now, with an IQP isolated queen's pawn position, what's very important is to keep the square in front of it under control. This knight on g3, where does it want to go? Where does this knight on g3 want to go? And for what reason? Well, oh. boom, step one, castles. Now step two, guess what I did? And for what reason? I really, really want this bishop on f5. Wouldn't that be juicy attacking the queen? Then I played rook c8, great position. There's a knight on g3 and it's stopping me from doing it. Now, I don't wanna go bishop d6 and bishop g3, that's ridiculous. I don't wanna weaken the dark squares. So what do you think I did? Bingo h4 and he had played b4 out of a little bit of panic and i win the pawn and the game ended in a draw i failed to win but the plan was successful so here you see this idea applied not for an attacking reason but simply for the positional reason of getting the knight out of g3 that's an inherently good thing um and once again i've pushed a lot of pawns in front of my king but black's king is still okay black's king is still doing just fine because there's no pieces there and um yeah.
Can okay, so can white go h4? Now, if white goes to h4, then that pawn on h4 is a lot weaker than its counterpart, precisely because the knight on g3 doesn't allow white to go g3 himself, and black can go knight g4. And this is horrible, because now that we're he's gonna lose the pawn, and the whole position collapses. Um I hope that makes sense. So here are some examples. Um, and I didn't mean to just show my games, but uh, this is what came to my mind of similar ideas. And now you can see that this is not some sort of outlandish and incredibly uncommon idea. Um, and that is not to say you shouldn't be careful about pushing a pawn in front of your king. You, you absolutely should. Um, whenever you play a move like this, you need to weigh the, the positives and the negatives. And the situation here is complicated because after queen b6, king h1, now knight h4 drops a piece, as happened in the game. But Ryan, if you had taken a on h4 immediately, then uh, queen h5 no longer wins a piece because uh, the queen on d defends the bishop, right? So what should we do here if we're white? Tricky question for you guys. Queen h5 doesn't win the bishop. Should we play queen h5 anyway? Is it worth it? Why or why not? And if not, what else, should we, what else can you offer? Okay, it absolutely is worth it. Yes, that was a bit of a trick question. Because after you lure black into playing g6, and that is the only move, because f5, there's an passant. h6, you already know how to respond to that. Look at these dark squares. And that is the whole point of h4. We get our queen into h6. And now we're gonna go knight e4 and bishop g5, or maybe rook f4, depending on what he does. And black is busted here, completely and totally and utterly busted. Uh, the dark squares are incredibly weak. Black is falling apart. All right. So that's the secondary idea of a choice. It's not just some gimmick to win a piece. The bottom line is you're trying to uh, mate black on h7. If h6, then you already know from the game that the move is bishop takes h6, blasting through the gates. White has an overabundance of attacking pieces. All right. Uh, so queen b6, king h1. Now the last thing is if we had gone queen e1, um, the Sam Shanklin question comes in handy. Queen e1 defends against uh, knight takes e5, right? Because if h5 and knight e5 can't take because of the pin. So it's very logical to defend uh, e5. What happens if we do it anyway? Well, wait a second. Well, we thought we had knight takes e5, but in comes queen takes d4 check. Boom, boom, fork, black is up two pawns. And just like that, the tables turn. So that is the power of that question. What happens if we do it anyway? You force your brain into considering this option, and then the rest becomes pretty easy to calculate. Okay? Um, so that's the reason we, we dropped our king to h1. Yeah, but now you can play bishop e3. Yeah, but but that how does that help? Because bishop e3, queen takes e5, and black is up two pawns. How does black react after queen h1? No, black is busted after queen h5. Like, already in this at this position, black is in big trouble. Now, I think that maybe the last chance was to counter-strike in the center with c5. And I will finish this game with this um, advice uh, that I don't know how common it is. I, I mean, again, I'm not fully aware of the sort of, you know, what you guys are learning right now. But when I was kind of growing up, there was this very common refrain, meet a move on the flank with a blow in the center, right? Any move on the on the side of the board, like H horse, should often be met with a with a blow in the center, and that is a lot of truth to it. So when you see a move like H four or G four, that tends to strain your opponent's resources, and it tends to weaken the position. And um, the move C five is logical from the point of view of undermining the base of the pawn chain, trying to get more activity for Black's pieces, and kind of complicating the game. Um, Okay, so h4, that's that idea. And that was a great game, Ryan. I think that was a very rich game. And I really, really appreciate uh, you playing. And, and of course, uh, the rest of the game, straightforward though it was, just pointing out that we could have taken the bishop, but this is even more straightforward.